This 1975 Mercedes 280SL has got an alternator problem whereby the alternator is not putting out the full 14 volts to charge the battery. Usually when you start the car and you hold a voltmeter across these terminals here, you'd expect to get 14 to 14.6 volts. And if you're getting less than 14 volts, that generally implies there's some problem with the charging circuit, but not always. For example, our SL55 here has a starter battery in the front and a consumer battery in the rear. And when you first start the car, the um, current is drawn from the starter battery and the alternator only charges that starter battery for something like five minutes. And then the battery control module in the rear of the car switches the full alternator charge to the consumer battery. So if this car had been running for a little while and you put a voltmeter across the battery, you might only find 12.6 volts across the battery and it would be wrong to um, conclude that there was a problem with the alternator. If you are getting less than 14 volts across your battery terminal just after starting the car, just before you run out and buy a new alternator, often the culprit is the voltage regulator, which on this particular car is screwed to the back of the alternator. The voltage regulators have carbon brushes inside them and they do wear out in time. So we are going to take the precautionary measure of swapping out the re regulator in this particular car. They're only about £20 on eBay. Well, it's taken ages to get here, but our new voltage regulator has finally arrived. It is a Beru 1 GER005. This is the one that the um, SL shop sell on their website. We bought this particular one on eBay. So we're going to have a go at fitting this and seeing if our alternator now puts out 14 volts. You can see that the brushes on this old voltage regulator are a little bit worn, but not so worn as to stop this thing working. So we just have to see what happens when we put the new one on. We got that new voltage regulator in. My advice would be to take the old voltage regulator and just practice putting it in so you know the exact angle that it fits in because you want to try and avoid damaging the brushes on the new voltage regulator when you put it in. We've got the voltmeter hooked up directly to the battery showing a full charge of 12.6 volts. We've got a new voltage regulator in the back of the alternator. Let's see what voltage we get here when we start this car up. So even with a new voltage regulator, the alternator is putting out some voltage, but not above 14 volts. And the next thing to check is that all your earth connections are good, specifically the earth connection from the battery to the chassis of the car. The alternator casing earths to the engine of the car. But on this particular model, there's also or should be a copper earth strap from the back of the alternator to the engine block. Now, when I had a look at that, it was connected with a rusty bracket like that. And if you've got rusty connections like that for some reason, that can also cause resistance and cause the alternator to be putting out less than ideal voltage. Last but not least, if we crawl underneath this car, there will be an earth strap going from the transmission, which is this thing here. This is the earth strap here. There'll be an earth strap from the transmission to the chassis of the car. And if that connection there is dirty or corroded or not 100% perfect, you may also be losing some voltage there. If you find that you're only getting 13 or 14 volts um, across the battery when you put your foot on the accelerator or you increase the engine revs, the thing to do is to check the exciter circuit, which is the blue wire leading to the red ignition light on the dash. Now, when you turn the key in the ignition and that red light goes on, you are sending 12 volts down that blue wire all the way to the back of the alternator via the plug. And if you did a voltage reading there, you would get 12 volts less the voltage drop across that red bulb. What you've now done is set up a magnetic field in the back of the alternator. And when you turn the ignition key one further click and the engine starts spinning, the alternate magnetic field is then cut by the magnets in the spinning alternator, thus inducing a voltage in the outer wiring windings of the alternator, which then charges the battery. The reason that ignition light goes out once the engine is spinning is because 
if you took a voltage reading on that blue wire once the engine is spinning you will find it's higher than 12.6 volts or whatever your battery voltage is and that's basically pushing voltage back up that wire towards that bulb and you no longer have that potential difference of voltage at that bulb and hence the bulb goes out. The last thing to mention just before you diagnose this actual car is that if your idle speed is too low you may find that your voltage from the back of the alternator is too low at idle to charge the battery so you're not charging the battery at idle you're only charging the battery when you're driving at faster speeds the one thing I've noticed on this car is there are plenty of bits and pieces and connections on this car that were not done by Mercedes. And we're going to start off by examining the wiring from the alternator to the battery to make sure it's as it should be. Now, down here, leading from the alternator plug, is some wiring which is not Mercedes wiring. And I want to see what is underneath that wiring, or this tape, I should say. Maybe somebody has joined the wires and they've broken or maybe they've joined them incorrectly okay well there we go look at that these wires have indeed come apart in fact they've all come apart look at that my goodness wow well i think we may have found what the problem with our alternator is namely that somebody has used these cheap connections here to join the wires and of course they've come apart this is the other end of the wires here. And of course, this wire here is the um, exciter feed wire. And if that's not connected, then of course your alternator won't work. Just have a look at these wires. Can you see how there's short wires here? What they've done, it looks like they've gnawed through the insulation with their teeth rather than using a proper set of wire strippers. If you merely cut that insulation with a knife, what you end up doing is cutting half the strands. And of course, these are the main alternator output strands. Each one of these strands of copper is designed to carry a certain amount of current. So if you nick the wire when you're stripping it, you will change the resistance. I've rejoined these alternator wires just using some Wago clips as a temporary solution and let's just see what happens now when we fire the car up. Do we suddenly get 14 volts at the alternator? In theory you could join the alternator wires here but it's not good practice so we're just going to get some new wires run them back through the in insulation and then recrimp on flag connectors and run the wires back up to the connection board up here. Just arrived from Auto Electric Supplies. These are the guys we got the wire from to make up our wiring loom. Um, is the braided cable that we're going to need to make up a new alternator wire, a new blue wire as well. And they also sell the Bosch style plugs here and the flag spade connectors that you're going to need to crimp on the end of the wire there. Just in case you ever need to get one of those flag connectors out, there is a plastic tab in there that you need to push down to remove the metal flag connector. So this basically sits in there like that. And to remove it, you put a small screwdriver down there and push that plastic tab down and the flag connector should come out. In order to strip this cable, we can use the same wire strippers that we used to make up the wiring loom. You want to strip about that much of the cable off. That gives you a beautiful clean cut without snagging any of the copper wires. And then we just need to crimp a plug on like so. We're going to use the same crimpers that we used to make up our Dejectronic harness. The only thing I've done is I've unscrewed the jaws and spun them around so the biggest jaws are now on the end and we won't be able to crimp this in one go. We'll have to do it in two goes. So first I'm going to crimp on the, um, the insulation and then I'm going to do the second crimp which will be to crimp the copper wire in. So here goes. 
that is a perfect crimp on the insulation and now we need to just try and do the same for the actual copper wire and there we have a perfect crimp the wires and the cable is crimped perfectly that is totally secure and not going anywhere now we just need to click that all the way in. We are going to have to make up our own ring terminal because the ring terminals that you can buy tend to be designed for one wire and therefore these little bits that fold over and clamp the wire tight are not big enough to accommodate two wires. You can see here we've got two wires and these long copper bits here are long enough to wrap around the wire. So what I'm gonna do is attempt to make up my own copper ring terminal, and then I'm gonna see if I can tin plate it. So we're gonna start off just using an old bit of copper pipe, and we're gonna cut out a piece of copper using an angle grinder that's gonna be wide enough to accommodate those triangular wraparounds there. To measure how wide the copper needs to be, we are going to wrap a piece of tape all the way round, like so. Then that will tell us how long the copper's got to be. So we just need to take that piece of tape off, put it onto our copper pipe, and then we need to cut a copper pipe with that width. Next up, we'll just cut the end off so we've got a nice clean cut. Next up, we just need to measure the length, which is the same as this. Now we just need to draw around this, cut off the excess. And that should be almost job done. When you cut these bits off, you just need to remember that the triangles are opposing. So when they um, roll up and lap over the wire, they'll kind of meet up. So we're gonna cut this edge off here and this internal piece here. The last thing we need to do is just trim a little bit off these wings here, because these are gonna wrap around the actual copper cable. They don't need to be as long as these bits, which wrap around the insulation. Next, we're gonna drill the hole in here. We're gonna use a center punch to get that hole exactly centered hopefully I'm just gonna step up the drill bit we're just finishing this off now with a finger file rounding the edges smoothing any rough bits then we'll make this completely shiny and then we'll tin it hopefully this is how the finished product has come out here is what you can buy commercially and you can see that with no all the will in the world you're not going to be able to clamp those wires on the terminal that we've made up here you can see that we can clamp both those wires in safely and clamp the copper to the copper nice and firmly um, the other thing that I'm going to try and do is to see if we can tin solder this and that just means heating this piece of copper up and putting some solder over it to see if we can tin it. Now ideally to tin solder this you would use the process of electrosis but we're not going to do that. We're going to use this quick method here which is just to rub some tin solder over this. Ideally you should cover the copper with flux first, not whatever you do do this while your wife is still in the house. What we do is then sand this flat. Well, that's not perfect, but it's better than it was and it's good enough for this job. We've got the two red wires through the insulation up here and we're just about ready to strip them and put our um, terminal ring on there. The one thing I was going to do was run a complete new blue wire, but it transpires that in order to do that, I'd have to unravel the wiring loom all the way back to here, all the way through the car to behind the dash. And I'm not going to do that. I'm going to actually join the blue wire here. Rather than use something like a Wago clip or a cheap and nasty non-insulated terminal, we've crimped these wires together and we'll just put a little bit of heat shrink over there. And then once we put a little bit of proper insulating tape round here, you'll never see that and that'll be as good as new. Just noticed that 
on my silver car, this should actually be on this side here. And the disadvantage of having it on this side is these wires are practically touching the chassis of the car. Um, so we're going to undo all of this and see if we can route the wires to the other side. Well, that was another example of when five minute jobs take almost two weeks because it transpires that we had to do the whole job again and make those wires longer because whoever put the car together actually routed this main harness the wrong way. They routed it directly around there. Whereas in actual fact, the harness is supposed to be clamped to the side of the car using these special um, cable ties. And once you do that, the wires that we had made up were not long enough. In the next video, I'm hoping to get onto the brakes. We're going to hopefully find a master cylinder for this car, connect all the brakes up, and then we can connect the prop shaft up to the rear diff and see if the transmission works in this car and if the car actually moves under its own steam. Once we've got the car moving, the plan is to get it up on the ramp so we can take all the subframe off, powder coat it, and get this car looking as good as new again. We got our voltage regulator on eBay from these guys here, Auto Part 24, paid £17.52, including postage. We got our cable from these guys here, Auto Electrical Supplies. They have a massive range of cable, including the braided cable that you'll need for this job. We use the general braided cable and a size of 4430. As I mentioned, they also sell these Lucas Bosch alternator plugs, which come with these flag connectors here, £4.56. These are generally only available in bags of 10 or 25, so it's actually cheaper to buy the plug than it was to try and get hold of the individual flag connectors. I have to say that these guys have been really impressive, apart from having a huge range of stock. They've always sent everything to us to arrive the next day, which is great if you're restoring a car and you find out you've bought the wrong wire or you're short or something. To be able to get a replacement the next day is a huge advantage, so a big shout out to Auto Electrical Supplies.